Why are valvular emergencies so confusing to understand? I think it's because there are so many different possibilities. Let me explain. There are four different valves in the heart, and each valve can be stenotic or regurgitant. Therefore, there are eight different major valve problems that can occur, and each one has different criteria and treatment. You can even classify them as to acute or chronic, so this can be quite confusing. But stenotic valves generally don't cause true emergencies. They obviously create problems with other illnesses or present, such as sepsis, but we're not going to talk about valvular stenosis today. And since acute pulmonic and tricuspid regurgitation are rare and don't make you quite as sick, we aren't going to talk about them either. So now we're left with two true valve emergencies. These are acute severe valvular problems that can cause hemodynamic collapse, acute mitral regurgitation, and acute aortic regurgitation. First off, we need to discuss the heart sounds associated with each of these conditions, including S1, S2, and opening snap. I'm just kidding, I'm an emergency medicine physician and this picture gives me PTSD from medical school. We are going to use ultrasound today. Consider this patient, a young female in respiratory distress. She's ill appearing. She actually came to the ED requesting opiate detox. However, she's noted shortness of breath for a few days. She has crackles, JBD, B lines on lung ultrasound, cold extremities with prolonged cap refill. I'm concerned for cardiogenic shock. But look at her echo. The parasternal long and parasternal short axis look fairly normal at first. Normal ejection fraction, no pericardial effusion, and no right heart strain. Now look at the apical four chamber view. Still looks fairly normal. But what if I tilt my transducer to obtain an apical five chamber view? In the apical five chamber view, look at the aortic valve. Notice that the aortic valve leaflets are not co-apting or coming together. This is a big problem. And on the color Doppler, there's a large regurgitant jet. How do I know that this is regurgitation? Well, there's three reasons. First, I see continuous flow in the LVOT. I know that there should be no flow in the LVOT in diastole. Number two, the jet is bright. Bright means fast blood flow, usually turbulent blood flow. And finally, number three, the jet is red. We know that based on this color scale here, that a red signal is blood moving towards the probe. Blood flow should be going away from the probe in the LVOT and appear blue. So this is a case of acute severe aortic regurgitation due to endocarditis causing a flail leaflet of the aortic valve. Let's discuss how I came to this conclusion and my treatment for the patient. But before we get to the treatment, let's discuss when we should even consider a valvular emergency. If a patient is a, an apparent cardiogenic shock with a low blood pressure, inadequate tissue perfusion, and beelines on their lung ultrasound, but also has a normal or hyperdynamic ejection fraction, this is when I consider a valvular emergency. We typically think of cardiogenic shock from systolic dysfunction or a poor ejection fraction. And on a large study with over 1,700 patients, People had an average ejection fraction of 20% in cardiogenic shock with a maximum of 30%. So for me, the five causes of cardiogenic shock with a normal ejection fraction are number one, acute aortic regurgitation, number two, acute mitral regurgitation, number three, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction with systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, number four, acute VSD, number five, HEF-PEF or restrictive cardiomyopathy. Here are the basic concepts of valvular emergencies. Acute, severe, aortic, or mitral regurgitation can kill you quickly. The valve leaflets don't coapt or come together, so a large amount of blood that was initially moving forward is now moving backwards. Compare that to valvular stenosis. You can't have an acute stenosis, so it's always chronic, and aortic stenosis kills you slowly. The valve leaflets are calcified and thick, which prevents blood flow from moving forward through the valve. However, both can lead to decreased cardiac output and cardiogenic shock. Here's the appearance of regurgitation on ultrasound with color Doppler. Regurgitant jets will be fast and turbulent blood flow, so the regurgitant jet will appear bright and behind the valve as seen here. Here's the most important slide. As the severity of the regurgitation worsens, the regurgitant jet fills more of the affected chamber, and the narrowest portion of the jet, called the vena contracta, gets wider. As a good rule of thumb, if the regurgitant jet looks like a small, lighter flame, it's not hemodynamically important. If it looks like a flamethrower filling up greater than 50% of the chamber with a wide vena contracta, it is likely hemodynamically significant. Using the concept of a large regurgitant jet and a wide vena contracta, which two echoes here show the most hemodynamically significant mitral regurgitation? Well, the answer is the top two, with the worst being on the top right, the widest vena contracta, and a mitral regurgitant jet that takes up over 50% of the left atrium. 
In a close second, you'll notice this one, still a wide vena contracta and a mitral regurgitant jet that takes up less than 50% of the left atrium. These two in the bottom are not hemodynamically significant. You have a narrow vena contracta and a small lighter flame mitral regurgitant jet as seen here and here. One important concept to recognize is when the valve leaflets are not coapting. Here's a zoomed in clip of the mitral valve not coapting as seen here. If you see this, you know there must be regurgitation at this valve. And if you look closely, this leaflet is actually a flail leaflet. The leaflet is pointing behind the plane of the valve or the annular plane as seen here and here. This is a much more obvious example of a flail leaflet as seen here, and then mitral regurgitation as seen here, filling up nearly the entire left atrium and very bright. And as a reminder, acute aortic regurgitation can be caused by an aortic dissection. You'll see the dissection flap here, and then a bright and wide aortic regurgitant jet. So to summarize, acute regurgitation kills you quickly. Blood flow is now going backwards that should be going forwards, and generally greater than 50% is classified for severe. So how do you make the blood flow go forward more? Well, you need to decrease the blood pressure or the afterload. You need to increase the heart rate to improve cardiac output, and you need a surgeon to fix or replace the valve. I think of acute severe regurgitation similar to a necrotizing soft tissue infection. The patient needs surgery, but we can do a few interventions in the emergency department to help them make it to the operating room. So for all valvular emergencies with pulmonary edema, everyone gets diuretics. The one exception is left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, and if you're not familiar with that concept, please see my other lecture on this. So the treatment for acute severe aortic or mitral regurgitation will be furosemide plus nitroglycerin to target the lowest mean arterial pressure possible for organ perfusion. You'll note that the heart benefits from low blood pressure from after load reduction, but suffers from too low of blood pressure since you compromise coronary blood flow. This creates a double-edged sword. Keep the blood pressure low, but not too low. Number two, if that's not working, consider epinephrine to increase the heart rate and number three, consult cardiac surgery to replace the valve. So when we discuss specifically aortic regurgitation with the concept of blood flow coming back into the LV during diastole, fluid backing up, causing pulmonary edema, decreased cardiac output and death, the major etiology for this is endocarditis, aortic dissection or trauma. And if we use POCUS, we'll see a big regurgitant jet in the LVOT, flail leaflet with poor coaptation of the aortic valve. You have to note that Mechanical circulatory support is now contraindicated because you need a competent aortic valve for these interventions. So the treatment here will be to lower the blood pressure, to increase the heart rate, and to consult cardiac surgery if you do not have an aortic dissection. If you do have an aortic dissection, you'll still lower the blood pressure, but now the heart rate is a little bit tricky because you'll normally increase the heart rate for aortic regurgitation, but you'll want to decrease it for a dissection, so I really don't have a recommendation here. You'll still consult cardiac surgery, and prayers are often helpful here. Now let's talk specifically for mitral regurgitation. It's similar to aortic regurgitation in that fluid is backing up, but now it's in the left atrium. It still causes pulmonary edema, decreased cardiac output, and death. The etiology is slightly different. Now it includes MI and endocarditis. POCUS will still have a big regurgitant jet in the left atrium this time, and you'll still see a flail leaflet with poor coaptation of the mitral valve. But now mechanical circulatory support is indicated since you likely have a competent aortic valve. So the treatment is going to be similar, but now you can have mechanical circulatory support, so a cardiology consult may be helpful for some interventional procedures. Here's a single slide on aortic or mitral stenosis. Remember, stenosis kills you slowly or causes problems with another illness such as sepsis, but the concept is blood flow is unable to move forward due to a fixed obstruction, so you need to improve filling of the chambers to improve cardiac output. So the treatment, inotropy does not help since the valve is firmly fixed and the heart is not actually seeing the afterload that it normally sees. It only sees the fixed obstruction from the valve. So slowing the heart rate to improve diastolic filling is actually very helpful. And finally, cardiology consultation can be considered for balloon valvuloplasty, which can bust the valve open as a temporizing measure. This is how I use POCUS and cardiogenic shock. 
First, I'll start in the peristernal long axis view. I'll look at their ejection fraction. If their EF is less than 30%, then they probably have half ref causing cardiogenic shock. I'll also put on color Doppler on the aortic and mitral valves to look for a big recurrent jet. Remember, you expect to see greater than 50% of the chamber behind the valve filled with regurgitant jet to be hemodynamically significant with a wide vena contracta. Then I'll move to the subcostal view and I'll look for a pericardial effusion. If I see this, I'll consider an aortic dissection. Then I'll move to an apical four chamber view and I'll place color Doppler on the left atrium and the LVOT looking for that large regurgitant jet. And finally, I'll move to the apical five chamber view and place continuous wave Doppler through the aortic valve to look for aortic regurgitation or left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. If you feel good about everything I've said so far and you want a more advanced POCUS measurement, you can take continuous wave Doppler through the aortic regurgitant jet in the apical five chamber view and get a tracing of the blood flow. Notice in this patient, the steep aortic deceleration slope marked in blue. This aortic deceleration slope is directly related to the pressure halftime, which is beyond the scope of this lecture, and therefore the steeper the deceleration slope corresponds to a shorter pressure halftime and more severe aortic regurgitation. So the steeper the slope, the more severe the aortic regurgitation. Here's one more advanced way to determine severe aortic regurgitation. You'll obtain the suprasternal notch view. So here is the aortic arch and the descending aorta here. You'll place the pulse wave sample gates in the descending aorta. If you get the pulse wave tracing, you'll notice that this is the baseline here. So everything above the baseline is blood flow going towards the probe. You'll see holodiastolic flow reversal here in the descending thoracic aorta. This indicates that blood flow is moving the wrong direction in diastole as seen here, and you have acute severe AR. Let's go back to our patient requesting opiate detox and look at the apical five chamber view again. You'll notice poor coaptation of the aortic valve leaflets here, and this aortic leaflet here pointing behind the annular plane indicating a flail leaflet. POCUS immediately diagnosed the acute aortic regurgitation while the patient was sitting in triage. I immediately consulted cardiothoracic surgery and treated the patient with furosemide and antibiotics for suspected endocarditis. Cardiothoracic surgery felt the patient was too high risk for operative intervention. She was ultimately admitted to the CCU. After a few days of medical management, she did not improve much and ultimately required an aortic valve replacement. Here's my final slide for the treatment of acute severe valvular disease. Let's start with the most deadly conditions, acute MR or acute AR. In both of these conditions, if they have pulmonary edema, they should get diuretics. In both of these conditions, you'll want to drop their blood pressure as low as possible using nitroglycerin to allow for forward flow. You'll want to increase their heart rate to increase their cardiac output, and usually that means with epinephrine. I recognize this may come as a weird situation where you have nitroglycerin dropping a blood pressure and epinephrine increasing heart rate, but that's just how it is. For mechanical circulatory support, you cannot use it for aortic regurgitation because you need a competent aortic valve here, but there is options for mitral regurgitation. Still in the emergency department, I would consult cardiac surgery or cardiothoracic surgery because ultimately they're gonna need their valves repaired or replaced. Moving on to the less deadly conditions, mitral stenosis or aortic stenosis. If they have pulmonary edema, they're still gonna get diuretics, but you don't need to drop their blood pressure since their heart is not seeing that normal afterload, they're seeing that fixed valve. Their heart rate in mitral stenosis should be lowered with esmolol because you wanna improve diastolic filling of the LV. Therefore, you should use vasopressin or phenylephrine since that often induces a reflex bradycardia. Whereas in aortic stenosis, that's not a problem, so you can use a normal norepinephrine. There are options for mechanical circulatory support in both of these conditions, usually a balloon valvuloplasty. And so in the ED, I would consult cardi cardiology because cardiac surgery usually does not do anything for these patients acutely. Thanks for listening. Let me know if you have any questions or comments below.